Thank you. And yeah, thanks for inviting me to speak. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, actually. So um, I am not really that familiar with doing presentations with uh, PowerPoint. Uh, it's not something that I normally do, but we do do walking tours and other kinds of things at Mole Hill for people in person. So I hope I'm able to get across, you know, what Mole Hill is all about and, um, you know, the history of it and, and, and what really goes on there through this presentation. Um, I know that there's people in this room that have got great knowledge about some of the things that I might touch on. Um, if you feel like sticking your hand up and, you know, giving some extra detail, correcting me if I'm wrong, um, that's absolutely great. Also, ask questions. You can stick your hand up and ask a question at any time, as far as I'm concerned, um, if you need any clarification. So, some of you are, will be familiar with Mole Hill. Some of you might never have heard of it before. Um, this is a picture of Mole Hill from the air. Mole Hill is a single block of heritage properties right in the middle of the west end of Vancouver. So the houses were all built between 19, uh, 1888 and I think 1910 is the most recent one. Um, it's not 100% absolutely perfectly intact, but it's the best example of an intact block from what the, all the streets in the West End and what a lot of the blocks in Vancouver looked like in the Victorian and Edwardian period. Um, I'm just going to point, use the little pointer thing. So, Mole Hill, it's an official designation of a name that was given to it by the city of Vancouver. And the designation specifies that it's the area enclosed by Thurlow Street, Comox Street, Butte Street, and Pendrel Street, which this is Pendrel Street and along Thurlow, sorry, Thurlow's down here, up Comox and Butte. So this is a Mole Hill house there because it's enclosed by the street, but this apartment building isn't Mole Hill. That's across the street. You have to be in this block to be in Mole Hill. Um, it has a a unique history of why it survived. The whole of the West End was dozens and dozens of blocks of houses like this, but they were all knocked down and removed and replaced with um, three, four, five story walk up apartment buildings and increasingly, as you can see here, towers. So these kind of, these kind of buildings were built in the, you know, after the Second World, oh, sorry, between the two wars, between the First and Second World War, and then these towers at the back that are cropping up everywhere now. And in fact, there's a new tower going in right there that is, I think, 27 stories right across the road from Mohill. So I'm going to try and explain a little bit about the history of the neighbourhood, a bit about the history of Mole Hill, a little bit of Vancouver history, then explain why Mole Hill survived, and I'll try and describe how it operates today. <clears throat> um, the city of Vancouver owns 30 of the 36 properties. 28 of those properties are leased to our non-profit society. So our society operates them principally as, as social housing. So within those 28 houses, there's 170 social housing suites. One of the houses is a group home, and there's eight young people with mental health issues that are, have live-in people teaching them life skills. One of the houses only has one suite in it, and it's mostly a huge big daycare that we rent to the YMCA. Um, and we have other facilities, like we have a common room that's, that's a, that gets a lot of use from all kinds of groups recovery groups, you know, strata meetings, parties, whatever. And um, it's kind of a park-like environment. This picture actually was taken quite a long time ago. I think it's about 18 years ago. But I'm using it because a more recent picture just has the trees are so much bigger that you can't really get a good, a good look at the houses from the air. I'll be showing you a, a, a more recent one 
at this point. Now, there's only one house that was moved there. The rest of the houses are all on their original footprint. This one here, which you can see, doesn't have its, its proper roof on yet. So this must have been taken right when that was getting moved there. That's called Watson House. That was a couple of blocks down the hill, and the city had actually knocked down the house that was on that property. But when Molehill was, as I explained, when Molehill was saved, they were like, well, we can move this other house that we've got and kind of reinstate that as being a, a heritage house on a heritage block. So um, that dates this picture to about 18 years ago, because I think that's when Watson House was moved there. This other new building here is the Dr. Peter Center, which is the HIV and AIDS resource center in Vancouver. And again, it was an instrumental relationship with uh, St. Paul's Hospital and with, with the Dr. Peter Foundation, which had already been founded, that caused that to be built. Hi, yeah. It had been vacant for a long, long time. I've seen pictures in the 1950s where there's houses there. There was like, it actually, you know, it was kind of a, um, an old fashioned, like three houses joined together thing. I, um, I don't have a good photograph of it though in, in this exhibition, but um, I, from about 1960 onwards, it was gone. There was nothing there. So here's some, some ground shots. This is Pendrel Street and Comox Street on the other side. So some of you experts will be able to determine the edge of these houses just from some of the features. Like this one is, this is an Edwardian period one. They're big, they tend to be bigger. Same thing with these ones. So, yeah. I will explain that right now. Okay, so let's look at this house. So we have 170 suites in basically 26 and a half houses. So the smallest house has four suites in it. Some of the ones that were built in, in the Victorian era are pretty small. Um, or they have other things in them like storage areas or office, we have a couple of offices. So this one here, there's a three bedroom suite in the basement. On the main floor, there's a very nice one bedroom suite at the front and a fairly modest studio apartment at the back. On the upper floor, there's three studio apartments that are really small. So they're about 250 square feet. And then there's an attic that's about 600 square feet. So there's 11 people live in this house and they all have their own kitchen and bathroom. None of our houses are, are, have got two staircases. None of them? No. They're not quite big enough for that. Uh -huh. The house I used to live on off Commercial Drive had two. Yeah. Um, this one, do they all have their own external entrance, or do they all go up like to sort of first staircase inside the house and it's kind of a private hall? Um, that that's a good question. It's a combination. So mostly you have to go in the front or the back, uh, yeah, okay, so in this case, you go in the front door, the person who lives at the front downstairs here needs to go in the front, common front door, and so do the people who live in the attic and upstairs. The basement suite has its own entrance at the back, so does the studio apartment at the back. So I'd say probably 60% of the suites, you have to go into the house, and about 40% of them have their own external doors. So that's how it works. The, the biggest one has 10 suites in it. And of those, and it's, it's actually one of our biggest houses. I'm just trying to think. No, it doesn't have two staircases either, but it's big. It's got, um, it's got five two bedroom suites and it's got um, a couple of studios and, and three one bedrooms. So they managed to squeeze them all in. Well, the whole, one of the points about Mole Hill is not just that, oh, look, these houses are preserved. They're only preserved on the outside. Yeah. On the inside, it's an exemplification of how you can um, do housing density without having to destroy the heritage. So, you know, the more suites you can get in there, 
the more affordable it becomes because the rental income you get from it is more. And, you know, we're still paying the mortgage to have them renovated. So the more suites they could possibly fit in, the better. Before it was renovated 25 years ago, there was only 60 suites in the houses. But I'll talk about that in a bit. They do. Yeah. <laughs> which resemble, I know, but they, you can tell the difference if you see them. Not in Vancouver. Here's a couple of the the older, the oldest ones. So the the one on the left there, that that's from 1889, and the one on the right is from uh, 1890. So again, these are pretty small ones. They have fewer suites. I think there's five suites in each of these, and there's no, and none of them are a family size suite. They're all singles. This is the oldest house in Mohill, and po possibly the oldest house in Vancouver that's still on its original footprint. So it's uh, at 1160 Comox Street. We call it the Mace House. So it's named after the guy that built it, of course, William Mace. He was just a carpenter from Scotland that built it when he got married. And, um, you know, it's a good example. The earlier ones are actually more interesting to me because they tended to be built by the people that lived there. The people that built them were usually kind of blue collar guys that were, you know, carpenters or construction contractors and this kind of thing. We've, ex we've explored the, the full history of everybody who was the first owner. So, you know, we know a little bit about who he was. This one's got some, it's got a wooden spiral staircase in it and things. But of course, all those features, they're, they're sort of still in there. We have lots of stained glass panels. We've got, you know, fancy pillars and things. But they're all enclosed inside people's suites. So this is the other thing about Molehill. It's not a museum. This is why a lot of people that walk past it or even live close by, they don't really know what goes on there. They just know that there's a big block of old houses there that look nice. But, you know, we don't have panels describing what it's like. These are not houses that you can go into and experience the layout of how they were originally. We could put them back that way, but it's really not possible to, to, to make it an attraction in that way. We got a lot of inquiries from film companies if they want to come and film there, but we always say no for that reason. You know, you can't just go into somebody's you know, we can't give permission to go into someone's suite and it doesn't look like what they think it looks like inside. And um, we have some great gardens at Mole Hill. That's one of our features, is that it's got a park-like environment. There's a park on the next block and Mole Hill is thought of as being an extension of that park. It's supposed to be inviting. We've got lots of outdoor seating areas and um, we want people to come and wander around. These are some of the little public, these are pub, little public walking areas. This is a private, this is a balcony. So the one, you know, the one major change if you were a heritage buff and you were walking around Mohill, the one difference is that they have modern fire escapes and modern fire systems. But they were quite cleverly done um, because so many of the suites, especially on the upper floors, are really small. Um, they were, it was specifically redesigned so that the common areas inside and outside the houses could be used by everybody as common space. So well, you might only have 200 square feet in your tiny studio apartment, but you've got this huge big, you know, fire escape balcony that you can share with your three or four neighbors on that level. And people really make the most of it. We've got some amazing gardeners at Mole Hill, thank God. Saves us about $100,000 a year in landscaping. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that wee house again. And it's very picturesque in the winter. We never have a problem getting a good image for our Christmas card. <laughs> this is the Watson house, the one that I am to mention that uh, was the only house that was moved there. What's, I can't, his name was like over, his, I can't remember, his, he had this guy Watson, he was a reverend uh, Meth, uh, Methodist minister who actually married Mrs. and Mr. Mole, I think. But um, I can talk a bit more about the Mole family in a second. Well, the, original. the story of the paint is that um, Benjamin Moore 
did a project about 25 years ago where they scraped the houses to find out where the original colours of them were. And they created a heritage palette from there that you can actually, it, well, it was, up until about last year, it was through Benjamin Moore. It, it, it's now available, same palette, but it's from another paint company, but I can't remember what they're called. I think they bought the rights to the palette. So, um, was it Heritage Vancouver? Yeah. Did all of this work? It, is that Maurice? Yeah. You know about this? Heritage, <laughs> yeah. Heritage Vancouver uh, basically spearheaded the whole project and put together the color palettes for every house. You can actually go online and see what they all are. There's actually a couple of them are off now. We, we try and stick to it as closely as possible. We've made a, a couple of mistakes have been made. But um, the, so these um, colors, they've all got, you can go to Benjamin Moore, they've all got names like Pendrel Green and, you know, Comox Green and, and you know, uh, because they're named after the Mole Hill houses. And all over Vancouver, you can see houses with these palettes. Now it's kind of cool. Yeah, so same mechanical system. I the, the heat. Don't get me started on the heating, because, well, okay, okay, I'll keep this as brief as I possibly can. When the houses were renovated, which I'll talk about in a bit, they they thought it would be a great idea to put in some innovative technology, so they put in um, um, geothermal heating, which is a form of of heating where you drill a, a, a well into the ground and there's a heat exchanger that brings the heat up, kind of like a reverse refrigerator. They never worked. We're on top of a hill. 200 feet doesn't even get you to sea level. And they, were, they worked at first, but the field temperature has dropped so dramatically over 20 years that we've had to put in a whole patchwork of alternate systems. So the heating is one of our... If, we, if they hadn't done that with the geothermal, we'd, we'd be saving about $80,000 a year in repairs. And instead of having what they thought was going to be an efficient system, we have lots of inefficient systems. But, you know, that's, that's just the reality of having to manage the place. Yeah, they know. Well, they're not allowed to have an uh, air conditioner. <laughs> I don't know. If, no, I don't think there's any insulation. <laughs> they do get really hot. Here's a, this is a more modern aerial shot. This one was just taken last year. So there's a massive, uh, I think it's the, it might even be the tallest, it's sort of the second tallest uh, building in Vancouver is being built right now. It's called the Butterfly and it's just at Burrard and Nelson Street. And um, one of the construction workers took some photos for us. So you can see there's a hell of a lot more trees these days. And you know, this is the park. That Nelson Park. So Nelson Park formerly looked like Mole Hill, it was covered in houses. I'll go into that in a second. There's the Strathmore Lodge, that's the apartment building that was built in 2011 and these are all of ours. So there's a landscaped laneway through the middle and then we have a cross lane that the one I showed you earlier that people can walk along and there's lots of seating areas and things in there. So but let's go back to the, the kind of actual history and I'll explain why Mole Hill came to be and how it survived. You know, of course, like all of Vancouver, it was um, is, is on the ancestral territories of the indigenous people. So, and this is a map that was drawn in 1934. And um, this, this, is a, this is a map that's in the Vancouver archives and it was actually made by Major James Matthews, who is the guy that founded the Van City of Vancouver Archives. And I guess he put it together from oral history and speaking to people. So every little red name on this is supposed to be an indigenous village or where an indis indigenous village was. I'm a little skeptical of that. That's what it says in the archives. Just because there's a couple of places that it doesn't really make much sense, like here, that's Seawash Rock. It doesn't really seem like a good place to put a village. There's like a really steep cliff and there's almost no beach. But uh, it could just be indigenous landmarks. But, um, and this is Dead Man's Island, which we also know was not an indigenous village. It was a, a burial ground or a scene of a battle. So Mole Hill's right in the middle, just about there, just below the D, or just below where the word end. 
and that's the highest point of the, of the downtown of Vancouver. So it's downhill in every direction. Downhill this way to the main part of downtown. Downhill over here to Coal Harbour. This is English Bay. And then the whole Sunset Beach, Falls Creek area. Now, there's no villages actually up there, probably because it was really thick forest. Um, there were creeks there, so I'm sure indigenous people were up there. I've never heard that any artifacts or anything have been found, but I'm sure that they were there. There's a shot of Dead Man's Island. That's from about 1910. That's not an indigenous village, though. That's squatters. Yeah. So the whole colonial period began with this bloke, jo uh, Jose Maria Narvaez. So he brought a European expedition in 1791, first of many. And, um, you know, they came poking around, drawing maps and seeing what was going on on the Pacific Northwest. And he was the first one to really enter the Burrard Inlet. And then, of course, George Vancouver the following year, more famously, perhaps. But the first three guys that actually owned the West End are these three. The, the three green horns. So from left to right, William Hailstone, Samuel Brighouse, and John Morton. So collectively, they all came uh, from England on the same boat to join the gold rush up to the Caribou in 1862. Like a lot of people, you know, rapidly discouraged and disillusioned with that. So they had to find something else to do. Um, so the very same year that they, you know, landed, they um, gave up gold mining and collectively purchased 540, well, purchased, I think you stake a claim. They, st so they stuck a, a claim of 180 acres each, which was the maximum amount that you could do on the entire area that's now considered Vancouver's West End. Um, their idea was that they, were, they thought it was going to be great business. They thought they were going to have coal there. Um, they thought there was a coal seam. And they were from an area of England that had coal mining and pot <coughs> potteries and brick making and stuff. And uh, they knew that where there's coal, there's often minerals that can be used to do those things. But um, actually, they weren't very successful. Uh, were, within a year, they had been persuaded to give away one third of their property to CP Rail, you know, with the idea that, well, when the railway arrives, we'll be rolling in money because that will be bringing in tons of people that want to live here and buy bricks and coal and so on. But the railway didn't arrive till almost 25 years later. So um, they were never successful. They called it New Liverpool, a name that didn't stick. And um, Hailstone went back to England. Um, Brighouse became a successful businessman in Richmond, and there's a whole neighborhood and a Sky Train station and so on named after him. Morton, he, he was a successful businessman too. He was an interesting little story about, about John Morton is you sometimes hear the story about Dead Man's Island that uh, you know, a, a, a Westerner went on the island and found these cedar boxes filled with bones. That was him. So, um, nothing really happened in the West End for almost 20 years. People weren't building. They were, all, they were just all living down in the uh, river and basically taking their cue from the indigenous people and getting everywhere by canoe or by trails that mostly followed the, the water. But when the railway did arrive in 1887, it was pretty rapid. The population grew up and people did suddenly did want to buy these lots in the West End. So this is a picture taken from Mole Hill, very close to Mole Hill, about, about just on the other side of Nelson Park. So at Butte and Nelson, those of you who, might, who know that neighborhood. And we're looking down towards that, um, the, to the Burrard Inlet. So this is, the, this is the bit of, that's a bit of Stanley Park there. Going out to Ferguson Point, I guess that is there. So this is 1890, you're seeing these houses starting to be built. And by this point, there was already a few houses at Mole Hill. 
This is a guy that I would just want to talk about because he's the one responsible for naming the four streets of Mole Hill. Lachlan Hamilton. Just want to tell a little story about him. He was born in 1852 um, in Peterborough, Ontario. So it, when he was 19, he was employed by the British North American Boundary Commission. And so he was surveying the boundary between Canada and the US. In 1880, he got a job working for CP Rail. And so he would survey and lay out the streets round about where CP Rail were putting in their stations in places like Edmonton. And in 1883, he arrived in Granville Township. Vancouver was not incorporated till three years later. But he surveyed and laid down all the streets. And he also was given the responsibility of making up names for them. So he named 30 or 40 of the streets in downtown Vancouver, most of them. Most of the main streets, he made them up. First one he named after himself, Hamilton Street. <laughs> then a few of them he named, like four or five of them, he named after his colleagues or his friends that were working for CP Rail. And then a large amount of the other ones he named after geographical features that he found on an ordnance survey map of BC. So just to give an idea of where that's coming from, Butte Street is named after Butte Sound. So Butte Sound itself was named after the Marcus of Butte. So about 100 years before this guy named Butte Street after Butte Sound, Butte Sound had been named by one of these explorer groups after the Marcus of Butte for some reason. Marcus of Butte is the um, hereditary keeper of Rothsey Castle on the island of Butte in Scotland. The word Butte itself means a beacon fire because there's a beacon fire on that island. So a couple of years ago, the CBC did a whole feature about the street names of Vancouver. And of course, they concluded that mostly they were named after European men. And in cases like Butte Street, they determined it was named after the Marcus of Butte. In fact, he didn't, this guy didn't name it after the Marcus of Butte. He thought he was naming it after a, like a, a, a passage of water. And whether or not you can actually then go back and say, well, it's named after the island, it's named after the Marcus. I took issue with that. And that's the case for three of the streets at Mole Hill. The, one, the Comox Street is named after an indigenous word. He was on the first council of Vancouver. So this is a famous photograph before City Hall was built, rebuilt, I guess, after the fire. That's Lachlan over there. I think he was the secretary. He was a councillor. But Mole Hill itself gets his name from these characters, Mrs. and Mr. Mole. So, um, for a long time, we didn't have a picture of Mr. Mole. We only got pictures of Mr. Mole about five years ago. For about the last 30 years, Mrs. Mole has always been the kind of patron person of Mole Hill. She's been on t-shirts, she's been on posters, she's on leaflets. We have that a big portrait of her in the common room. We didn't really know too much about her. Um, we, we, knew, we knew some stuff, but... Um, what happened was about five years ago, descendants of the Moles gave a big uh, donation to the city of Vancouver archives, and that's where this photo comes from. So it only emerged five years ago, and we've now got a few photographs of them. But a really interesting thing that was in that donation, and why we now know a lot more about them, is that um, Mr. Mole kept a diary for, thir like, there's 30 volumes of a diary that they donated. So... This is the covers of two of them, 1872 and 1876. So the earliest one is 1872. The most recent one is 1914. And, um, you know, it's great reading. There's a few missing years, unfortunately. Um, so what happened with Mr. Moe was that after he, you know, didn't become rich from the gold rush, he got a farm in what is now Southlands, in Vancouver. So this, this is the Fraser River. This is like Southwest Marine Drive basically along here. Up here is the Musqueam Indian Reserve that still exists to this day. So over here would be UBC. Down here is like Fraser Street. 
So there's, there's what it says his name there. These, each one of these, these enclosed areas is a farm. So there's Mole, McGee, and McCleary. So throughout his diaries, he talks a lot about McGee and McCleary and their children and so on, because they're always helping each other when they have to chop down a tree or build a fence or get a cow onto a canoe. Like they're always coming over or he's always going over there. And, it's quite an amazing, I don't think anybody nowadays would be prepared for the amount of work that, that Henry Moe puts in that he describes in these diaries. So it's almost like, a, um, you know, it's like a farmer's almanac. He always starts with the weather, what direction the wind's blowing. Then he says what he did that day and he sometimes gives descriptions of what the crops are doing and so on. And then he, describes what business he might have done that day, and then there might be a few personal details. And, um, you know, he'd, be got, he'd get, we'd think nothing of getting up at five in the morning, walking 25 miles along this trail to New Westminster, which was the capital, you know, conducting a bit of business, and walking back home and getting home at 11 o'clock at night. More typically, he'd be getting up at the crack of dawn, doing all kinds of things in the morning, you know, taking a break to visit McGee or whatever um, for a couple of hours. And then, you know, McGee would come over and they'd spend seven hours threshing corn and stuff like this. It's, it's, it's just relentless day after day after day. And it's, you know, the amount of things that he does that nobody would ever do nowadays, like he would, um, in December, slaughter a cow, load it into a canoe, canoe it to Moodyville, which is in North Vancouver, so it's a seven-hour canoe trip to across the Barard Inlet in December, you know, do sell it, unload it and everything, and then bring it back. And he still managed to remember to write his diary every day. <laughs> so what happened, though, was that he got married in 1881 to Elizabeth Ann Mole. She had two children from her previous marriage, um, the two girls there, Polly and Jane at the back. And then together they had twins, uh, John and, and Anne, who are the, the two smaller ones there. When those children needed to go to school, he, they were you know, a good Christian family, Methodists, etc. He, he moved down to the West End. So he was one of the earliest people that we know built a house in the West End. And it was not actually on the Mohill block, but it was just across the road and it doesn't exist anymore. But that is the family at their house at 1025 Comox Street. So it's now where St. Paul's Hospital is. And of course, like all of the good old timers of Vancouver, he's buried at Mountain View Hospital, uh, not at the Mountain View Cemetery. So both Mrs. and Mr. Mole and, and their son are buried here. Sydney's, but they both, both of them all came from Cornwall. Mrs. No, he he lived. Henry Mole lived to be eighty-four, and Mrs. Mole died when she was forty-six. So this is a map of ninety of eighteen ninety. So this was kind of uh, maybe it's maybe a little bit difficult, but there, this person actually drew this map and showed where buildings existed in the West End. So this is Mohill here. So this is actually a larger map that you can get from the city archive that's got the whole of Vancouver on it. It's pretty cool. So in the Mohill block, we only have five houses. That one there would be the Victorian house that I showed a couple of times on uh, Pendrel Street. This would be the oldest one from 1888. We know that these were the five houses that would have been there at that point. And then by this map's from 1912. So this is, this is Mole Hill over there. This is the, just the part of the West End that's close to Mole Hill. But you can see most of these blocks are now filled in with houses. So, and, they, and they were all very, very similar to the houses at Mole Hill. There's a shot from the roof of the uh, apartment building at Mole Hill looking towards Stanley Park. So you can see these are all roofs. It's like almost none of that. There's a, like maybe two of those houses left. This is one of our, our uh, founding house builders, Mayor Alex Bethuni, who is 
Um, it was the fifth mayor of Vancouver. So he actually was the was the mayor during the anti-Asian riots in 1907. He was an explicitly racist guy who was a member of the Asian Exclusion League, which was a um, white supremacist organization which specified they existed to keep Vancouver white. So, and he, he did, there's, there's several different things that he did. Um, you know, tried to prevent immigrants from getting off of boats and passed laws to prevent, um, you know, freedom of movement and business owning by anybody that wasn't white. Um, and he lived at 1173 Pendrel Street, which is where my little office is now. <laughs> this is the... Is this where the sandwich got the idea? Huh? Is this where the that, it, got the idea of shipping? This is, I know, this is very similar to what happened in the States with, yeah. with bringing illegal immigrants from Mexico and dumping them in New York City. Yeah. It's the same thing. Now, the mayor of Vancouver apologized in 2018 for that, the, everything that happened back then, and Justin Trudeau apologized for the federal government's role in, in, in these kinds of things. But they didn't actually repeal most of the laws until after the Second World War, the ones that prevented movement and, and business ownership and, and suffrage and these kinds of things. This is outside of his house, so that's our big rhododendron. This is actually one of the big rhod biggest rhododendrons in BC. And the reason I'm going to say that is because it's a famous rhododendron on Vancouver Island that's called Lady Cynthia. And um, it's got its own Instagram account. And every couple of years when it's in full bloom, it's on the news, you know, the and finally tonight thing. I've actually seen the Lady Cynthia, and, and I've seen this one, and ours is bigger. Like, it definitely is bigger. So this is the thing, it's not just some of the houses that are, that are heritage. We have lots of heritage trees and shrubs that have been there for a long, long time. That's Sandra, our property manager. Oh, you mean oh, <laughs> the tree? <laughs> you, mean the, you mean the rhododendron? Okay. So there's a funny story about that. I had an idea because I was like, look at this stupid ladysmith thing. It's not as big as ours, and here it is on the, in the paper again. And we should give it a name, and then people will know. So we actually had the suggestion of calling it Lady Catherine, which was the name of Alex Bethany's wife. And, um, and then, you know, then people, th there'll be a contest between the rhododendrons. But that got immediately binned, and it's called Rhoda the Rodo. So... <laughs> That's, that's what it's called. It's called Rhoda the Rhodo. <laughs> this is another early resident. She was the only woman who was an original owner of any house on Mole Hill. Kate Costello. She was a widow whose husband had died in 1906. Um, they owned a hotel downtown Vancouver, which she sold when he died and built this house as a rooming house. Now, that foreshadows the future of Mole Hill because before... Like, by the time of the Second World War, lots of these houses had, had become rooming houses. We know most of the original owners had moved across False Creek to, like, Shaughnessy, Kitsilano, um, Point Grey. And um, they became kind of lodging houses and bed and breakfasts, most of them. And then this kind of thing was going up. So that's the, it was the Queen Alexandra Apartments. That's the apartment building that's on the corner of Mole Hill. Had a big fire in 1927. Five people died. But w the good thing about that apartment building is that we do have some good aerial shots. So this is taken from its roof. So this, if you know the area, this is now Nelson Park. This is Mole Hill. So, and this is where St. Paul's Hospital is now. It's really weird. They, there's not a lot of photographs of Mole Hill in the 20th century up until about 1980. It's, you get them from all kinds of funny places like this postcard. This one, this is also taken from the, the same roof. You can see this, the, Vancouver, the Hotel Vancouver being constructed. So this would have been then in the 1930s. That hotel took about 10 years to build, so I'm guessing about 1936. Here's another weird photo. It's like we don't have an old photo of this house. This was a, a scandal of Vancouver in 1932. One of, the ranch, one of the bigger houses there was taken over by this cult, and this wife of Dr. Bloomberger got embroiled in it. And there was this, um, you know, quite a salacious, complicated story 
where um, the doctor sent their teenage son to infiltrate the cult uh, to find out what his wife was up to. And the son came back and said, hey, they've got a whole bunch of your paintings from your private collection in the uh, temple. So he called the police. And when the police came, they hustled his wife out of the building and hid her in East Vancouver for five days. And then they sort of set her free. And then that's where the story ends. There's no conclusion to this scandal. Other than, you know, Mrs. Bloomberg tells her, her, her tale of being abducted for five days and the doctor was happy to get his wife back. But it's the only photo we have of that house. This is another one. That's Mole Hill in the distance, but you can see all around it are starting to be much bigger buildings. This is another just a random shot that somebody had taken. This was a surveying, pho a photograph that somebody was doing a surveillance in the, in the 1960s. This little boy, the little blonde-haired boy, he just came into our office one day. Now he's about 65 years old. And he had a couple of photographs of Molehill because he grew up in that house behind. So he had some great tales to tell us. I love when things like that happen. So there wasn't really an understanding that these were valuable heritage assets until, um, you know, the night the 1970s, nobody really was even thinking about that. Um, but what had happened was that because all these other apartment buildings were being built, the city recognized we need green space. And so to that end, they started buying the houses at Mole Hill and at the neighboring block where Nelson Park is now. Whenever one of those houses came on sale, the Parks Board bought it. So from the 50s through to the 90s, that's how they acquired the 30 properties at Mole Hill. That's how, then that's how Nelson Park was built. So Nelson Park, they, they knocked them down faster there. For some reason, they didn't. Maybe they just wanted, we'll do one block, then we'll do the other block. So they did Nelson Park. Um, by the 70s, Nelson Park was there. And there was this, this is from a tour guide, of walking tour guide of, of Vancouver from 1974. So, you know, this is when they're first starting to recognize that there's some heritage value here, maybe something that should be preserved, something interesting to go and look at. There's an area, this is taken from St. Paul's Hospital, probably up on the 10th floor or something. Maybe the mental health unit on the 9th floor. And that's, so here we are, this is, this is in the 1980s, so we, that whole block next door is now the park. And these are the houses not looking particularly good, but still standing. So because there was starting to be this recognition, people were starting to come up with ideas. This is an undergraduate thesis written by a student called Penny Gerdenstein. Um, and this was her proposal. So this, this already was there, that's the park, same as it is now. And here she proposed knocking down some of the houses that she didn't know were, were valuable. Saving 16 of them, the apartment building is still there, but it, in the infill there was a lot of facilities, like she had a vision of there being a cafe and park areas and, and community gardens and so on. And this, this student ended up being the professor of the UBC School of Community and Regional Planning, amazingly. She's retired now, but she had an amazing amount of foresight. This is the earliest example of somebody proposing something that um, actually looks like what Mole Hill looks like now. So when the people were, when the Parks Board bought these houses, they just were renting them out and they weren't really looking after them. But there was about 60 or 80 people living in them. And um, there was a sort of slow realization that the houses were gonna be destroyed eventually to make the park. And so to that end, everybody got started you know, getting together because the, the, this, this was a proposal released in the 80s. This is the, the city's idea. Knock down everything, put in four tennis courts and a football pitch. <laughs> so when this kind of thing was becoming public, the tenants all got together, started to do some organizing, get, started getting a lot of press. It wasn't named Mole Hill at this point, it was Nelson Park. The name of Mole Hill came about as a result of this activism to save it, to give it an identity. So um, these are some of the pictures back in the early 90s they would get together. These are some of the activities. The, the city had several plans, one of which was to put towers there. 
they'd have events pretty much every weekend, like yard sales and barbecues and things. And when people came to them, they'd educate them about it and do history tours and tell them, you know, why it was valuable to save them. Um, let's see. One unfortunate thing that happened, one of, our, one of the activists was actually the result of, was killed. She was murdered at Mole Hill. This is like one of the tragic things that happened in 1996, right in the middle of all this advocacy period. Muriel Lindsay, in this case, is not solved yet. I don't have time to go into it, but it's, it's really sad. And I still get at least a couple of people come into my office every year who are interested in finding out what happened here. But it's still a cold case. Eve Lazarus wrote about it in her book, Cold Case Vancouver. So the Bronfman Foundation were the first one that got on board, gave them a big grant to save it. And this is um, just more scenes. And what eventually happened was that they persuaded, after about eight years, City of Vancouver got on board, BC Housing got on board to, to help fund it. And the three organizations, Mole Hill, what, actually, one thing I didn't mention was that there was a, another organization formed called the Friends of Mole Hill, which consisted of about 30 nonprofits from the West End or around about Vancouver, people that were into heritage, gardening, health stuff, the Dr. Peter Center in St. Paul's, the West End Seniors Network. They formed a federation to save Mole Hill, and really that was the thing that finally finally got the city to get on board with it because they realized that we could provide... Um, Resources, resources, you know, housing resources, yes, but other resources that these other organizations would find valuable. So all this time it was owned by the city of Vancouver. Yeah. But what then happened was part of the, okay, so in the deal, the city of Vancouver leased the 28 houses to Mole Hill, which it then became the Mole Hill Housing Society um, for 60 years for $10. The Housing Society took out a $30 million loan to renovate the houses. And so we went from about 60 tenants to 170 tenants, plus it got all this extra landscaping and so on. So there was a period of about two years when all this reconstruction was going on. The tenants moved out or they got moved around. Some of them went on holiday for a year. But they were able to all come back. Here's some more pictures. The, a lot of the work that was done in the alleyway to do the landscaping was all just done by volunteers. That's them building the community gardens. This is the greenway that goes through to the park. That's what it looks like now. So there it is then, here it is now. So that was how the alleyway was originally, and when they finished landscaping it, that's what it was like. It's even much more lush than that nowadays. And, and in 2004, it was officially declared open. Whoops. This is the opening party. Quite a few of these people still live at Mole Hill. That's Councillor Jim Green. This little girl that's cutting the butt, the ribbons, you know, she's like 27 or something now, still lives there. Quite a few of those people I recognize. And here's some before and after, so before the construction and after. Lots of the houses had all kinds of weird things built on them. Like the coat porches were enclosed and stucco was added, so all of that was removed. That's Butte Street. That's a picture from the park. This one's interesting because you can see the towers that are now encroaching. Mm -hmm. So I, a lot of people sometimes ask me about how the housing program works. So um, because it is social housing, it's a mixed income thing. I don't really have much time, so I don't want to go into it too much. But there's 170 units and 102 of them are subsidized. They're for people with really low incomes. So low-income families, seniors that are on a fixed income, PWD, you know, persons with disability benefit, um, those are our tenants. The other 68 are what we call low-end of market suites. So they don't actually receive a housing subsidy, but the market rent is 
it never exceeds 30% of their income. And it's more or less set according to um, a kind of breaking even thing. Like, as long as we're breaking even, it's fine. We only take um, applicant, we have, don't really have an open application list. We only take applicants right now from advocates. So almost all our family suites are women that are coming from other organizations that deal with families fleeing abuse, these kinds of things. Um, the single people that we have on our list usually are in home, near homeless situations. If you've got an advocate, we'll take an application from you, but you can't just walk into the office. There's no point because we only get hand two or three vacancies a year. Like nobody can move out. There's nowhere to go that's affordable in Vancouver. If you fancy moving to a different neighborhood, forget it. It's impossible. You know, my son lives over on Barclay, which, well, so I've been looking at this for about eight years. But. Right. This is our occupancy standard, so we don't have a single empty bedroom. Not allowed to have an empty bedroom. If you're an empty nester in a two-bedroom suite, you have to downsize immediately because there's a housing crisis on. And if every housing society had three empty bedrooms, then, you know, that's a, got a knock-on effect. You have to, you know, there, there'd be a thousand housing societies, there'd be 3,000 empty bedrooms in, in the lower mainland. I'm just going through this fast because I'm running a bit out of time. There's our income range for the different, most of our people are in the low range. There's almost nobody in shallow. It says 20, but it's more like three. The, house, the way economics have worked, everybody's either in the low end market or deep subsidy. Here's our tenant selection. You have to be in core housing need. You can't move to Mole Hill unless you need housing. So you have to either be living in housing that's too small for your family, that is in threat of being homeless, you know, that is poor, is in like terrible condition, bad for your health. That's why we need an advocate to apply for you. And these, here's our expenses. So we break even $2,220,000. Most of our money is from tenant rent. The rest is topped up by BC housing and then there's a little bit of extra. Most of our expenses is the mortgage. The property tax is massive. Here's some community pictures. We have an art gallery that's really popular. Of course, we're still having parties. There's Jag Jagmeet Singh. Sorry. He was here politicking. No, so this is actually at Mayor Alex Bethuni's house. I wonder how he would like the idea of a <laughs> left-wing Sikh, you know, national political leader doing a speech in his garden. I hope he sees this. And we do walking tours. Anybody, anyone wants a, a personal tour of Mole Hill if you're in Vancouver, you know, just call the office or drop by and I'll take you around. These are our little seating areas. You know, book exchange. Bands in summertime. Looks nice in the winter, let's see. Here's our staff. This is Sandra Martin, so she, we only have four staff. This is our property manager, Sandra. I don't know if any, some of you will know her. She was on the board of the BCHF uh, about five, six years ago. And she's a very, and she's from a museum background, actually, Mackin House in Coquitlam. And, uh, but she's a very excellent person and a very, just a superb property manager. This is her kind of assistant property manager, Gary. He's a good laugh. The lady on the right, she, is, uh, she works as an advocate, the woman with the white hair. We set up a second society to, to support seniors and people with disabilities because it's hard to get supports. So she coordinates that. The lady in the middle donated $4,500 to form that society. So that's when that photograph was taken. These are the meal ladies. So one of the things the new society does is do meals and coffee mornings and things for seniors. This is Sam, he does all of our carpentry work. And we have, that's, we have huge amounts of maintenance because this is the kind of thing we get a lot of. Damp, rot, so he's just really good at doing this and he's been working at Mole Hill for 25 years. This is inside the suite obviously, there's nothing heritage about that. But you know, these are in the hallways. 
So you can see how much wood there is. You need, you need a specialist. We can't just get in a regular person to fix these things. And people don't look after their sweets, look. Here's another one. This is Alex Bethuny's house again. I'm not joking. This is 1173 Pendrel Street. So, you know, when these people move out or get evicted or die or something, it, you know, you take out all this junk and it's, it's just insane the amount of restoration you need. What else? We have lots of community partners because there's a lot of community stuff happens at Mole Hill. I'm just going to go over this because I'm almost out of time. So the legacy of Mole Hill is that um, we're constantly being cited and, you know, by students and by, you know, plans like the Vancouver's West End plan. There's always this idea, oh, we, you know, this can be done, we should do more of this, but it never, ever happens. Um, there's just not a political will to make it happen. The politicians nowadays don't have that, that vision, the generosity of leasing all these, like that resource for $10 for 60 years, basically handing it over to the community and say, do something with it. They would never do that nowadays. Here's one of our houses. That's got seven social housing suites in it. There's our assessment, $13.5 million. So our income from that house is about 6500 a month. So, I mean, this is just the reality. There's another one. There's Bethuny's house, 6800 this is their idea, yeah. This, I know, I made these slides before. So this house, this is the city's idea of heritage you know, preservation now. This is the original house. This is the proposal to build behind. This is one of the private houses at Mole Hill. So it's like completely out of scale. And there's still a lot of activism at Mole Hill, like this kind of thing, to try and you know, keep standards of heritage preservation realistic. There's still a lot of that goes on. And then here's our final aerial shot. And then goodbye. Uh, <laughs> and I'll leave you with that picture. It's a bit more interesting. Yeah.